The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Blackfire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Marietta. Chapter 30. I was drifting across a vast field of iron corn and emmer wheat, oat and rye. Even if I were possessed of normal memory, I wouldn't have known the names of these wild cereals. I wouldn't have recognized the various oaks, pistachio trees, the tamarisk, and the ash. I wouldn't have known that I appeared to be somewhere between Raqqa and the Syro-Iraqi border where the Euphrates River flows through a steppe landscape. Without memory or any frame of reference, I simply knew I was lost in some alien place that was little different than the one place I had been recently. My only memory was that strange community of outlandish people and a beautiful blonde woman I had slept with who had vanished completely. It was all just a medley of confusion loss and unnatural surroundings. Now, only the sky seemed the same. The sky, an otherworldly sapphire blue, with traces of bleached white clouds. Despite my total consternation, I was slightly comforted by the air that was clean and sweet, filled with the aromas of woodland plants and vegetation carried by the winds across the Euphrates from the Tigris. How the fuck did I get here? I moved slowly and cautiously through the field toward what appeared to be a small Moorish or Arabic farm isolated at the edge of a Zeric woodland. As I drew closer to the farm, I saw that the decaying clay and tile house appeared deserted with broken wood fences and the small stone barn crumbling into ruins. I responded to a sound that came from inside the bar. With my limited memory, I could not distinguish the sound as that of a lamb crying for its mother. But I moved slowly to the barn, wary and uncertain, trying to adjust to the dim light inside. I could barely make out a shadowy figure hunkered down in a corner of the barn where old hay and straw gathered. As I drew closer, I could see that it was Oren, and he was smiling wryly as he stroked the small woolly lamb in his lap, then took a quick swig from the whiskey bottle he held in his other hand. There was a man in the land of Uz, Oren whispered to me enigmatically, whose name was Job. Where are we, I asked, totally confused and perplexed. Somewhere beyond the Euphrates, according to the Dead Sea document, the War Scroll. This is a deserted farm in part of the ancient kingdom of Edom. I know that doesn't mean much to you. What am I doing here? Oren took another swift gulp from the bottle, then spoke quickly and confidentially. I brought you here, Rafe. Yes, yes, I know. I know it doesn't make much sense, but it has to do with quantum mechanics, you see, and alternate universes. There are things I know about both the mind and physics that most people don't know yet, but they will. In time, they will. But of course, what I know is very threatening to certain people. The reason I'm here is that I'm hiding out, keeping one step ahead of those who want me out of existence. Out of existence? What does that mean? It appeared that Oren was about to reveal that information but other bits and pieces invaded his consciousness and once again he was distracted. Do you know what auto-ignition or hot, rich flashover means? Well, it's high volume, turbulent velocity, super dense smoke. I'm sorry, I'm afraid my mind is filled with things that I I can't concentrate. Oren took another slug of the whiskey to tamp down the invasion of trivia. He took the hand that was stroking the lost lamb and popped his buzzing ear with the palm a couple of times, then continued trying to stay on the subject. 
Yes, but I, I brought you here for a reason, a very important reason. It doesn't matter how I did it, Rafe. It has something to do with reality, belief, and the mind. It would take too long to explain, but the fact is that I know everything and you know nothing. And that was a curious paradox I couldn't ignore. Knowing everything sometimes creates meaningful alignments. I know the girl, Jordan. I was with her and she disappeared. I, I searched for her, but I, I couldn't find her. Do you know what happened to her? Ordinarily, I would have to preface this information by saying how sorry I am. But that really doesn't matter. You see, Jordan is dead. Dead. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Well, anywhere else, it means that a person is gone and will never come back. But she can't be dead. I, I was with her. I don't want her to be gone. Rafe, look, I, I don't have much time, and I have to tell you about the opal. The what? The Black Fire Opal. It's the key to everything. It's one of the most rare and mystical gemstones in the world. In fact, it can only be found in two places on Earth, New Wales, Australia, and in the Virgin Valley of Northern Nevada. Oh, it can make incredible things happen, and it can destroy things. It is both symbol and substance. It represents both salvation and unspeakable horror. Oren took a couple of shaky swigs from his whiskey bottle. His eyes were glazed in red, showing a mixture of fear and resolve. But his purging of information was like an hourglass dumping sand, only instead of a regulated trickle from the top glass bulb into the bottom, Oren's unloading came in an uncontrolled sandstorm of rapid-fire thought which made him nearly impossible to follow. The name Opal derives from the Greek opalios, meaning all-seeing gem, sought after for centuries but one rare and exquisite opal, according to legend, unique among all the rest, reflects and refracts wavelengths of light, magically able to open up our third eye. I felt my small world shattered, but not because of anything Oren was saying about the opal. I didn't give a shit. I could only think for the moment about Jordan being gone. I don't care about an opal, whatever that is. I only care about her, about Jordan. I don't want her to be dead. Look, I know how you feel, Rafe. I know I was in love myself, you know. I loved my wife, Leona, more than anything. But then she changed. Animals are complicated, you know that? You have to factor in the expense of feeding, potential veterinary care. Uh, no, wait. I was talking about my wife, not animals. Although now she might be included in that category. You see, she got her own invitation to the resort. And when we got there, she couldn't wait to place a wager at Table 18. Ugh, Leona was so vain and ambitious, you can't imagine how obsessed she was with being beautiful. But not just beautiful, she wanted to be something very special, extraordinary, ravishing, you know what I mean? And she wanted to have power, to be important in ways that I, I couldn't begin to understand back then. She was willing to wager anything to obtain those qualities. I mean, anything. Her life, her soul, anything, whatever. Oren took a breath and downed another mouthful from the whiskey bottle, and he seemed to become disturbed and irritated. She's coming. Who's coming? My wife. I can feel her. Your wife? She's coming here? Yes, you've seen her. Her name isn't Leona anymore. She took on a different name when she won her bet. Her name now is Samanya. An exotic name to go with her new look and status. I don't know her. Yes, you do, Rafe. She works as the concierge at the resort. She and other disciples provide both care and security. She can never leave. Not ever. Do you know why? Because just becoming gorgeous and important wasn't enough for her. She wanted more, just like everyone else. They always want more. So she wagered a second and third bet and lost both. Now she must stay there forever. But I've run out of time here. I have to keep moving or they will find me and end my existence. But remember, Rafe, you can get your memory back because you still have a second wager coming to you. Do you understand? Try to remember that. You can get back all that you lost, your memory, your life. Remember that, Rafe. Remember that. Oren's voice grew weaker in quality and volume. I could not believe what I was seeing. Oren began to become transparent. 
to slowly fade until he had completely disappeared. The little white lamb left struggling to stand upright amidst the straw and hay on the rough-hewn floor of the barn. No, wait, I cried out, but it was too late. Within moments, there was no sign of the little man who knew everything. He had vanished into thin air. I stood there alone in the shadows for a long moment, and then I picked up the crying lamb and held it comfortingly. I felt a sense of despair sweeping over me, a longing to somehow connect with another human being. I didn't know why I felt this way, but the loss of that young woman I had slept with and touched intimately for only one night was causing me feelings that were just too painful for me to express or understand. Then I responded to a sound that I heard behind me, fully expecting to see that Oren had somehow returned. But it wasn't Oren. It was Oren's wife, the woman now known as Samanya, the gorgeous concierge with burnished skin, streaked golden hair, and the dark eyes that burned with a perilous black fire. She stood in the doorway of the barn, smiled sensually at me. Are you ready, Ray? Ready? For what? To get your life back. Come. It's time for your second wager. Chapter 31 Jordan could only remember one thing above all else. It was the terror of falling, the sudden rush of wind and the shrill echoes of her screams. The world seemed to twist and revolve around her as she fell, and she remembered scraping her fingernails on the balcony wall. There was no sense of her life flashing before her eyes, only extreme panic and the overwhelming realization that she was going to die. Her body arched and tensed violently as she anticipated that dreadful climax of the falling, the horrible impact that would be the last thing she would ever feel. But the impact never came. It was like falling into an endless abyss in which the dark shadows embraced her with painless unconsciousness. When awareness returned, she felt only the shock of light, a bright light that assailed her senses with its brilliance. As she became more aware of her surroundings, she was stunned to discover that she was standing in a queue, along with other strangers, at the check-in counter of an airport terminal. She had no idea how she got there or what she was doing there. She couldn't equate the dreadful falling that she remembered with the benign standing in this line. She knew she wasn't hurt in any way. She didn't feel any kind of pain anywhere in her body. It couldn't be real, and yet it was real. She was in a check-in line in some kind of terminal. She looked around and ascertained it was seemingly just like any other airport terminal she had ever been in, larger than the one in Las Vegas, but not as large as LAX or Heathrow. Then slowly she began to notice things that were not like other airports, things she couldn't quite put her finger on at first. The way the people stood, most of them with a kind of dazed expression none of them carrying bags or luggage of any sort. It was all dreamlike, yet she knew somehow that it was real. And there was something about the sound of that voice that came from the terminal loudspeaker announcing recent arrivals. Passengers now arriving from Canada, China, Iberia, Turkey, and Qatar, please queue up at the check-in counter before proceeding to any gates. And remember, alphas and omegas are automatically admitted through their previously assigned gate. It was said in a flat monotone like most she had heard before, but there was something in the very nature of the voice and its message that sent a chill of misgiving down Jordan's spine. Then she reacted to another voice, and she looked down next to her, where a small boy was gazing anxiously up at her. He was about ten, looked a little like her son Cody, but he had red hair and freckles, and his eyes were filled with tears. Are you my mama? he asked in a trembling, uncertain voice. Jordan was instantly touched and concerned. She leaned down toward him, ruffled his reddish hair, disturbed, wishing it were her son standing her beside her. No, honey, I'm not your mama. Are you lost? You look just like my mama. Jordan started to ask him something else that might comfort him or lead to where his mother might be, but she had arrived at the counter and the woman at check-in was asking her, Do you have a boarding pass, ma'am? Jordan glanced at the woman and frowned, confused, and said to the boy, Hold on just a minute, honey. 
I'll help you find your mama. She grasped his small hand and held it while she turned back to the woman behind the check-in counter. I'm sorry, but I, I don't have a boarding pass. I don't even know your name, please. The woman inquired, cutting off Jordan's attempt to explain her unusual circumstances. Jordan Carroll, two R's, two L's. The woman quickly entered the name into her computer and then glanced at Jordan with a slight smile. I'm sorry, Miss Carroll, but you're not terminal. You mean I'm not in the right terminal? Jordan asked her, confusion mounting. No, I mean you're not terminal. I, I don't think I understand. The woman smiled gently. I think you do. Your favorite poet said it for you. How well I knew the light before. I could not see it now. Tis dying I am doing, but I'm not afraid to know. Jordan stared at her for a moment, realizing she had known before, but didn't want to accept it. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she clutched the hand of the little boy more tightly. You mean, I'm dead? Dead? No, no. Dying, yes. But dead, no. If you were actually dead, you'd be on my list, and then you would go through one of those gates over there. The woman pointed to a series of gates at the end of the terminal. Jordan followed her gesture and reacted to the fact that there were a series of many gates that appeared to stretch off down the concourse into infinite space. The many signs overhead were not that of any particular destination or time of flight. The graphics over the gates were of ancient playing cards of the kind that Daniel had once shown her. She recognized some of the detailed graphics. There were flowers, birds, and wild men and animals like the Nine of Beasts over Gate 9. Over gate number one, there was a card with an ace of spades, then another gate designated as number two with a two of diamonds. It continued like that with the complete suit, just like the others, numbers five through eight with kings of all four suits, then the queen and the jacks, with gates all numbered seemingly on to an unseen 52, with only one that had an ancient joker symbol on it. The people lined up at the various gates, seemed to personify the nature of the gate card symbols. There were wealthy, sophisticated men, politicians, and royalty in the king lines. Working class, both blue and white collar in the jack suit card lines, while women lined up in the various queen suit lines. They all appeared to be a, an eclectic melange of rich and poor of many ethnicities and cultures, both hardworking and indolent, good and bad. The one with the joker symbol having the longest line of the oddest-looking people Jordan had ever seen. But why so many gates? I thought there were only two places that you go after death. Oh no, my dear, the woman said with a kindly laugh. There are many more places than you can possibly imagine. A deck of cards is just like life. There are political cards and war cards and religion cards. You've probably heard at least... Ten catchphrases a week that originated from card game expressions. The wild card, cards stacked against you, lay your cards on the table, the trump card. Sociologists and historians use these expressions as one of the measures of playing cards and their anthropological and sociological influences. There are far too many differences in people for their final judgment to be narrowed down to only two places to spend eternity. For instance, alphas and omegas go to the ace gates. What are alphas and omegas? Jordan asked timorously, unsure that she really wanted to know. Well, it's just a symbol that refers to the beginning and the end. Of course, the ace of spades has always represented taxes since the French Revolution. It also represented the lone man and was placed against the king in many games. Even if the people were considered nothing, at least they could overthrow him in their card games. One thing those people all have in common, they hate taxes. Now please, go to the information desk and they will tell you what you need to do. Next, no wait, Jordan cried out imploringly. My son Cody is here someplace. I just want to be with him. Please, can't I just go on and so I can be with my son? No, I'm sorry, Miss Carol, but that would be quite against the rules. Next, Jordan wanted to protest further, but she felt herself collapsing inside, her body trembling. She fought to control herself and then felt the tugging of that small hand still clenched in hers. She glanced down through her tears and could see that the boy had his finger up to his mouth, was indicating for her to be quiet and follow him. 
She turned slowly from the counter as other people came up. Jordan was now convinced that it was all just a dream, a strange and surreal nightmare like all the others she had been having lately, and that she would soon awaken to some other nightmare that might even turn out to be worse. It had been a cycle of weirdness she couldn't begin to explain or prevent from reoccurring. This one was close to being worse than all the rest. It was like Alice in Wonderland, and Jordan had fallen down the rabbit hole into a world full of strange people and playing cards. She had half expected the Queen of Hearts to show up screaming off with her head. The boy took her past the milling people who were queuing up at the counter and various gates. He glanced around to see if they were being watched. Then he pulled her down close and whispered, I know where he is. Where who is? Your little boy. I heard you say his name. Cody Carroll. Chapter 32. Samanya turned and walked back out into the light. I stood for a moment and then followed her out of the barn, still holding the lamb in my arms. Samanya stood just outside the barn, waiting patiently for me. Once outside, I saw a range band flock of sheep grazing just beyond the barn, and I instinctively put down the lamb and watched it as it moved back toward its ewe and the others of its kind. Then I followed Samanya as she continued out onto the field just beyond the farm. The sun was a dazzling disk overhead, and heat had begun to shimmer and ignite the field in a ring of fire. It appeared to me that yellow-red flames had actually erupted along a circular ring, and within the burning spiral at its very center, I could see the massive wooden table 18 and Daniel sitting at its rim. I stared in disbelief at what I could only imagine was some kind of illusion. But Samanya seemed to see it too, and she walked right through the outer edge of the flames without the slightest concern. She appeared unaffected by the low-burning flames in any way. Without any real memory of pain from fire, I followed Samanya through the flames, both approaching Table 18 and Daniel at the core of the burning ring. Daniel held a deck of cards in his hands, and he smiled at us as we moved to the table. Do you know what Saidi Amiya means, Rafe? Daniel asked quietly. No, it's Arabic. It means double or nothing. Wager one more time and you might win. Would you like to have your memory back, Rafe? Yes. Do you understand the terms of your second wager? No. Then let me explain it for you. If you win, your memory will be restored and you will be free to go wherever you wish. But if you lose, you will stay at the resort and work for me. Work for you? I, I don't understand. Every guest in the casino is faced with the same dilemma as you, Rafe. They are trying to make a decision whether to bet or not to bet, stay or leave, to tempt fate or accept the cruel reality of their destiny. But every person on our staff Every person that works at the Blackfire Resort and Casino has already wagered double or nothing and lost. Because of your past experience, you will help provide security. That's like a state of guardianship and protection. For how long? It will be quite extensive. Do you understand the concept of forever? No. It means never ending. You'll understand it better if you recover your memory. Shall we proceed, Ray? Are you willing to make the wager? <laughs> I guess so. You'll need to be more precise. Yes. Daniel's smile became more expansive, and he began to deal two cards for me and himself, face down on the green surface of the table. Then he began to deal the rest of the community cards face up. By the finish, I had three fours, but Daniel turned up a full house, nines over sixes, which was the winning hand. I'm sorry, Daniel said softly. You've lost your second wager, which means that you are now in my employ. But since I don't think you would be able to carry out your security functions properly without full memory, I'm prepared to grant you something I rarely do. I'm going to give back your full memory, Rafe, just to show you that 
I'm not without some measure of concern for my employees. It was at that moment that I remembered everything. Chapter 33. How do you know? Jordan shouted, incredulous, having grabbed the boy intently. I saw him. He's my age. He was wearing a bathing suit and a faded blue t-shirt with Lakers on the front. Jordan couldn't believe it. It was a perfect description of Cody the last time she saw him before he went into the water at the beach just before he died. Where did you see him? She demanded with a sob. Wandering around here, then I, I, I think he went through that gate over there because that's how old he was. The boy pointed to a gate that was marked by a nine of hearts playing card. Then he quickly ended their conversation with a disturbing suggestion that made no sense at all to Jordan. He couldn't find his mom either, just like me. I think he thought you didn't want him anymore. Jordan whirled toward the gate, tears streaming down her face. I've got to find him and take him home. But he's gone, the boy insisted. Why don't you just take me home? I'm here. I don't have a mom anymore. I'm sorry, but I have to find Cody. Jordan charged toward the Nine of Hearts gate, the little boy racing after her, arms outstretched imploringly. Please, I won't be much trouble. I can be your little boy. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Jordan mumbled, feeling only a twinge of guilt in the sudden rush of expectations regarding Cody. But the gate attendant at the Nine of Hearts gate stood in her way. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you can't proceed without a boarding pass. I don't have a fucking boarding pass. My baby is down there someplace. Let me go. Let me go. By now, a couple of security officers had rushed up and were grabbing Jordan and trying to calm her down. Please, ma'am, you have to come with us, one of them said in a, that officious way of security people. But Jordan screamed and fought against them. No, let me go. Get the fuck away from me. Their hands and arms tightened around her as she screamed and fought. Her eyes clenched tightly shut and welled up with tears. She battled them in the darkness of her own mind, a kind of curious dizziness suddenly overtaking her, the bizarre assemblage of images to which she had shut her eyes beginning to diminish. It was like she was intoxicated, high on something that was not agreeing with her. Slowly the world began to filter back through the slits of her semi-closed eyes, and she was aware that something had changed that the light was different, and the hands and arms that were unfolded around her were not quite as harsh and restraining as they had been only seconds before. Awareness had become a relative thing in this new and mad world Jordan had somehow inadvertently entered. She knew when she fully opened her eyes that she was no longer in that surreal terminal where the noun was actually an adjective, where the passengers seemed bound for some eternal destination defined by the archaic symbolism on the faces of a deck of playing cards. But somehow, instead of being transported any further along that curious final passageway, Jordan now found herself inexplicably back in her suite in the Blackfire Resort. She was half reclining on one of the massive lounge sofas and the arms that embraced her were not those of terminal security guards, but the supple golden limbs of the hotel concierge, the exquisite Samania. She was clad now in a black and gold silk kimono with a red sash at the waist. She held Jordan in her embrace and stroked her with light, gentle caresses. Jordan knew where she was, but she couldn't stop sobbing from the trauma of her experience place, the child who knew where Cody had gone, the frustration, the loss of Rafe as the man he had once been. It all swept over her and she cried, her body trembling with anguish. It's all right, Jordan. You're back now. It's all right. But Jordan knew it wasn't all right. Nothing would ever be all right. Nothing could ever be the same. Her logical mind was struggling to make sense of it all and she could still only come to a few possible conclusions. Either she was really insane, or going insane, or she had been drugged without her knowing, somebody having slipped her some mind-altering potion, or she was being subjected to some kind of telepathic hypnosis like she had seen in movies and TV. Those so-called logical answers still couldn't satisfy her confusion about the why of it all. Just trying to reason it all out in some way, that allowed her to maintain some equilibrium had totally exhausted her. 
that she could vent her feelings only through an emotional release. Samanya so stroked her neck and back reassuringly, her voice soft and comforting. Jordan had never completely trusted the beautiful but enigmatic woman, and she instinctively wanted to pull away from her, but she was too distraught to resist. The stroke of Samanya's hand felt strangely calming, and Jordan, at some visceral level, found herself enjoying the woman's touch despite her original feelings of suspicion and mistrust. Her mind wandered backward to a long ago time when her only friend, Tina, was there to support and calm Jordan in the aftermath of her father's abuse. Tina had been suffering from her own dysfunctional family, especially sibling rivalry with an older brother who lived to torture and malign his sister. She had no father, and her mother was always wasted on something, earning her drug money by sleeping with every willing male in the town. Tina was a beautiful girl, but she seemed to Jordan more male than female, a wild hair, tough and aggressive. But she was gentle with Jordan. When Jordan's father abused her, Tina was always there to console and counsel her. The affection slowly grew to a more physical soothing, and their mutual petting became the first sexual experience for them both. It had been Jordan's only encounter with another female, but it was memorable and satisfying. Sweet sensations were coming back to her now as she felt the soft stroke of another woman's hand. Samanya began to breathe more deeply, swaying slightly as she began to pet Jordan's face and twisted her fingers in the long and soft strands of her hair. A dark and moody creature, Samanya seemed now more like a lurking, testy spider. Her sexuality recognized no barriers. Her voice was both soothing and commanding as she encouraged Jordan to relax. That's it. Nothing to worry about now. She unbuttoned Jordan's loose blouse and pulled it slowly down over her shoulders and arms, exposing her lovely and perfectly rounded breasts. Her nipples were large and of a deep beige hue. Samanya caught her breath, holding her hands in the air just above Jordan's breasts, quivering as though the treasure was just too precious to touch. Jordan's eyes still closed was lost in a recessed space, aroused and responding, but to whom? She was trying to complete her lover's dream, but her lover had gone, was lost somewhere in both body and mind. Samanya had untied her kimono, revealing a beautifully pliable body, ignited to its highest point. She began to weave her web, kissing Jordan on the mouth with warm and rising rushes. Samanya touched her breasts and allowed her web to drop its silken cord from its secret hiding place, kissed Jordan's neck and shoulders, lowering her mouth and opening it wide to encase and suck on one priceless nipple. Then she began to tear the clothing from Jordan's body, unable to accommodate any delay. She was doing what she had wanted to do from the moment she had first seen Jordan. Suddenly in the movement, and seeming chaos above her, Jordan's fantasy began to diminish with the onset of fear. Passion gave way to vacant and detached excitement. She opened her eyes and saw herself woven into the web, being devoured by the widow. At almost the same moment, the door to the suite opened and Rafe appeared in the doorway. His face reflected his stunned reaction to what was happening on the huge sofa. Jordan saw him and rolled out of Samanya's grasp, scrambling for her clothing, but it was too late. Rafe just turned around and disappeared, shutting the door behind him. Chapter 34 I wasn't shocked by what I saw. I'd seen women making love before, and I can't say it didn't make me hard, because it did. I'd seen it in porno mags back in my teens, and there was a time when I was on narcotics detail with a BPD, and we'd busted into a drug factory. They always had those girls working naked so they couldn't smuggle out any of the goods. Two pretty girls were having sex in a side room. There was more than a little hesitation before we broke it up. But this time I wasn't shocked and I wasn't really aroused seeing Jordan with the concierge. I mean, somehow I knew whose idea it was. She tried coming on to me and you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know Samanya liked sex and any kind of combinations. I guess I wanted to intervene, but somehow I knew I had to let Jordan take care of it. She did, 
I could hear her right through the door. Get away, get away, don't touch me. Her voice was clear and pretty definite. No matter how Samanya had managed to break down her resistance at the beginning, no matter how far she had gotten, somehow Jordan had finally broken through and fucking put her off. I was still standing there outside the door when Samanya came out. I was standing there thinking about Jordan and how much I wanted to go in and see her, to comfort her, to let her know that I'd gotten back my memory. But something was holding me there with my back against the door. It was something I can't describe like a voice. No, no, no. More like a force of some kind that was interfering with my own volition. I realized in that moment that I really had no choice about continuing into the room and intervening. I was not under my own control. I was like, like an automaton, a robot, with someone or something operating me by remote control. I could think. I could remember. I could still move. But I could only do what that voice or force wanted me to do. Samanya had come out of the room, her face dark and bitter from Jordan's rejection. But she said nothing, just walked off down the corridor. I followed her once again because I was unable to do anything else. I followed her to a section of the casino I hadn't seen yet. I found myself in a dimly lit and highly secured room. The lights inside flickered, giving the cavernous area an eerie, disturbing depth. That wasn't the worst of it, not by a long shot. I was standing like in a police lineup. My head turned slightly so that I could see a man that, as an FBI special agent, I had helped shoot down in a cascade of bullets. I'd seen his body explode in a wash of blood, flesh, and bone. Yet, there he was, Stephen Glenn Weber standing not more than six feet from me and looking just as he had the moment before we had blasted the shit out of him. Christ, it was good to have my memory back, but it was about to drive me fucking crazy. But strangely enough, the feelings of panic and disbelief were slowly leaving me. They were gradually being replaced by a sense of comfort and relaxation that I don't think I'd felt since coming to this place. I was in a totally alien environment, standing in line with a dead man. The hotel's young social director, Carrie, and Samanya, the exotic concierge, along with a number of others who apparently were also members of the Blackfire Resort staff. All of them were a part of some weird and impossible scenario. I could hear Daniel's words still ringing in my mind. Every person that works at the Blackfire Resort wagered a second time and lost. And while none of what I was seeing made any sense to me, it didn't seem to matter anymore. I mean, some of the others, like Weber, were actual winners at Table 18 because Weber was back from the dead, so how could he or any other winner be staff? Also, he didn't wager from the fucking afterlife, so someone, maybe a relative or loved one, came to the Virgin Valley and did it for him. So it wasn't even his bet. Why would someone even waste a wager on bringing this sick bastard back from the fires of hell? Maybe being alive again wasn't enough for Weber. Maybe he wanted power or money or freedom to protect himself from agents like me. So he wagered and lost. Twice. Shit. Oren was right. Nobody's satisfied. Everyone wants more. Even winners. Especially winners. But again, the feelings of fear and dismay that had been overwhelming me were fading away, so I, I didn't care about any of it. I just stood there, watching what at any other time would have completely blown my mind. I became focused on Daniel Corinthus, standing at the center of some three-dimensional holographic images. At least it looked like a hologram. I had seen enough of them in cheesy sci-fi movies as a kid, where a person could visualize their image or recording from some remote location. But this thing was 
strangely different. It had a disturbing organicness to it. Daniel's body pulsing and sparking within the light like a violently beating human heart. Everyone knows that a holographic image is not the real person, but there was something about Daniel's image that made me feel like it was more than just reconstructed light, like his blood, flesh, and bone were actually present in the room, like a corpse's hand reaching out from the grave to grab you. And the blur of impressions were causing the strange and unnatural flickering of dull light. But while I wasn't sure whether the real Daniel was in the room or not, I was jolted by the fact that I seemed to completely understand exactly what the images in the holograph were illustrating. It was as if I was suddenly gifted with a kind of heightened intelligence I'd never known before. It wasn't like Oren, who seemed to be taking in a constant flow of information and had very little control over it. I certainly didn't know everything, but I was able to easily understand this particular level of physics, like I had studied it for years. It was crazy. Not very long ago, I couldn't remember my own name. And now, I was actually comprehending highly sophisticated theoretical physics. It surprised and scared the shit out of me. But I was still exhilarated by the unexpected expanse of my basic knowledge of physics. I would flunked much easier stuff in college. The large holographic images that surrounded Daniel were schematic figures of Maxwell's demon. The holographic Daniel spoke to us like a high-tech professor lecturing to a group of students in an advanced physics class, and I seemed to understand every word. Many authors in literature, including Thomas Pynchon, George Gamow, and Stanislaw Lem, have mentioned Maxwell's demon in their work, and hard science fiction authors have used the concept in stories about software programs to keep track of individuals' molecules in cellular automatons and even for heating homes. The great Isaac Asimov wrote a short story homage to Maxwell, and there have been games, films, and music using Maxwell's demon as the name of some rock groups. We see it even in puzzles where the point is for the player to represent Maxwell's demon and to separate elemental creatures despite their tendency to mingle. Daniel smiled wryly and then continued. So now in the spirit of this principle, you will proceed to the separate tasks to which you have been assigned. The VIPs will soon be here, and we must see to it that their every wish is accommodated. The staff lines dropped away and I was left standing alone. I felt aware that I was awaiting my own personal instruction, but something down deep inside of me was still fighting. I was still trying to resist the strange invisible magnetic power of some unknown force that seemed to have taken over my own basic molecules, guiding and causing my mind and body to function like one of those cellular automatons Daniel had talked about. His image was still smiling down at me, although the other schematic figures of Maxwell's demon had disappeared. I managed to gather up all my strength just to inquire hoarsely. Can you hear me? Of course, Rafe. I hope our own little thought experiment helped enhance your ability to follow along. I, I got it. But what's the point? The point is to fine-tune our staff for the benefit of our guests. You must always be well prepared for intellectual as well as physical discourse. Now, as for your particular assignment, I, I, I just want to get out of here. I explained that to you, Rafe. Your loss was my gain. There is no way you can get out. Not now, not ever. His voice and holographic face were like granite, definite, permanent. My stomach churned. I felt a wave of hopelessness sweep over me. Your background in law enforcement appears well suited for you to become part of my security team, Rafe. But first I must put you to the test. If you pass it, be assigned. If you fail, you will be eliminated. 
Do you understand? You can nod your head. There was only a moment before I slowly nodded my head. It was like the head of a puppet with the strings to nowhere providing its movement. I was now just another employee of the Blackfire Resort. <laughs> 